But anyway, we are very impatient people. And in fact, in life, we often find ourselves in situations where waiting is the only option, isn't it? And situations where, you know, you have your ticket in your hand, uh, like I said, in the bank, but then you have to sit and wait for your number to be called or sit in line and wait until it gets to your turn. Many of us are relationally waiting. Maybe you're waiting for Mr. and Mrs. Wright to show up, but your number has not been called. Or like Kenyans this week, the women were waiting for Chiloba, I mean, asking for his number. Number, but then they found out at the end he is I Pauline, madams, I feel your pain. You know, you just try and you're waiting. The dude is waiting for this mama, but it has not worked out. Maybe you've tr you're waiting financially. You've tried out many business ideas, but then it hasn't worked out. Or you've been, you know, praying and trusting that God will make your business have some financial freedom at some point, but it's not working out. Or a debt is mounting and you feel like you're just helpless. Things aren't working out. Maybe, you know, in career you're waiting for something to, to come up. Maybe you're waiting for the company to come at you and say, you know, finally we have seen you. We have understood the gifting in you and then, you know, and, and it hasn't happened. They haven't called you out. Or you're praying for your job thing to work out, for a job to come out for you and it hasn't come through. Or maybe, you know, in school you're, you're being praying that you're, you want to finish up a certain course, but life has happened and you just haven't been able to find the time to do that. Maybe you've been praying for a child and you're praying and you've been working at it, you've seen doctors and it's just not coming through. Today we're going to kick off a series called The Waiting Room. Over the next three Sundays, we're going to go and we're going to attempt to address this question. What do you do when you get stuck in the waiting room of life and no one is calling your ticket? What do you do when God does not seem to be coming through for you and you're left wondering, where is God in this situation? Isn't he concerned? I mean, you're in good company today because many of us have been through a situation of waiting or many of us are in that space. And many of the same doubts and frustrations about God are, are, are expressed in this space. The thing is, today we're going to have a conversation about two gentlemen who were in the space of waiting. And today we're going to begin by looking at a gentleman called John the Baptist. So I want to invite us to read from Matthew 11, verse 1 to 3. Are you guys with me? We're in the waiting room. So I'm going to read from um, the, okay, I'm going to read that one. This is the NIV version. It says, after Jesus had finished instructing the 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach, preach a preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come or who is to come or should we expect someone else? The message version is very interesting, and I want to read it for us. It says, when Jesus finished placing his charge before his 12 disciples, he went on to teach and preach in, the, in their villages. John, meanwhile, had been locked up in prison, and when he got wind of what Jesus was doing, he sent his own disciples to ask, are you the one we have been expecting, or are, are we still waiting? So Jesus was somewhere in Galilee, and he had just finished giving his disciples some specific instructions about how to go around doing ministry. And then later on, they go to Na he goes to Nazareth himself. And then some of John the Baptist's followers um, come all the way to ask him, are you really the Messiah or is somebody else uh, coming? The interesting thing about John and um, Jesus is that these guys were related. I mean, in, in 1 Luke 36, we see that their mothers, Mary uh, of Jesus and Elizabeth of John, were relatives. In fact, Mary had sought solace, solace and refuge with John's mom for a period, and she had stayed there uh, for some time. So in the African culture, we'd have said these guys were relas. In fact, they were kuzo. Kuzos. You guys aren't finishing for me. They were? So they were kuzo. So John and Jesus, uh, Jesus John was Jesus' cut and razor, and we all know this. I mean, I love events. When you go to a gig, you know, the, the, the cut and razor has a lot of work because this guy's supposed to warm up the crowd. I mean, the, the host today was supposed to warm you up before I give the word today. And so this guy, uh, John, what he had done is that he had been preaching, repent us in the wilderness. He was so dramatic. He had worn, uh, you know, camel hair. He dined uh, on locusts and wined on honey. And and one day when John was baptizing in the desert, just busy doing the same thing he had been called to do, he stops and because he sees Jesus coming and he says, okay, you guys, you guys have been following me, but this guy, this is the guy to follow right here. I mean, I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. Below the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is here. 
John the Baptist announced Jesus to the world. And then the other thing we see is that John is loyal. I mean, this guy made that need a decision because when he, he talks about Jesus, he says um, he's, he makes a decision to surrender himself and even surrender leadership because this guy had had a crowd of people following him for a long time but immediately Jesus checks in, he says you guy, this is the guy to follow he says this is the assigned moment for him to move to the center while I move to the sidelines I mean the NIV says he must become greater and I must become less, this guy completely surrenders to Jesus and the feeling for Jesus for John was absolutely mutual. Because, you know, when Jesus meets John, he says, when he, he meets him, he tells the people, truly I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the greatest man on earth. Can you believe Jesus saying something about you? Amazing. I mean, he was saying that this guy was greater than his mother and father. He was greater than the prophets of old, Abraham, Moses. Jesus was like, this man is greater. But as we speak today, we find that John, didn't, John was in prison. And the question that he asks when he's in prison is that John, we find him, him in, in a specific space. Because we know that John has been bold, a fearless preacher. This guy was unafraid to call out wrong stuff as he sees it. I mean, let me share with you some examples. What is some of the sauciest, the sexiest, most scandalous TV shows that we're watching right now? Or that we know of right now? You guys don't know any show? Of course, guys are like, no, no, Michelle's like, GOT. GOT is one of those shows. There's obviously Empire, the Scandal. I mean, there's, what John was calling out at that time is nothing compared to what he is calling out. What, or nothing compared to what those shows have. This guy was saying, uh, at the time, there was a, a, the king of called Herod. He was an evil king. And when Jesus was born, he killed all the babies at the time. But then when John, at this point, when John is in prison, uh, this king had died and his son also called Herod is king. But now Herod has a brother called Herod Philip. And they have a niece called, surprise, surprise, Herodias. All right. So Herodias falls in love with her uncle Philip and then they get married. Um, and this is weird because now he becomes her, her father-in-law, now becomes the brother-in-law. Make sense? Yeah. So now... At one time when this uh, husband of hers, uh, Philip Herod, goes away on, uh, to Rome for some, I guess, business or something, she ends up falling in love with the king Herod. And so she disses her brother and actually mothers, marries her brother-in-law. You guys are getting flowing with me? Yeah? So she actually marries her brother-in-law. And then now, um, who was actually her uncle. And then now when she marries him, um, she has left another uncle for another. There's this huge scandal in the city. I mean, the city can't get enough of this because they're just talking about it. They're like, what this mama did? She's a cousin. She's married so-and-so. She's ditched them. And then now there's this huge scandal. And John was one day preaching uh, in the streets. And John spoke strongly against this. And then he was thrown in a, in a desert, in a, in a dungeon, in actually a desert called Mache. Macarius. I want to say Macarius because that's how it's spelt. But anyway, so it was called Macarius. So John had begun to rot away in this dungeon. He was there for over a year. And what happened at the time is when you're in the dungeon, your friends actually have to bring you food because they, don't, they didn't bring food there. So he, was, he had called out the king. His friends were coming every day. And when he was there, he had some, some doubts began to to happen in him because it had actually been like a year when he was there and so when he was there he was being tormented he was uh, you know oppressed doubts and fears had begun to come into his mind and key among them was was I mistaken about Jesus he was like was that guy really the one because if he was the one, he was here to set the captives free. And even though he was convinced about Jesus when he said it, I mean, the time that he had been there, horrible accusing thoughts began to build in his mind. And he f found himself beginning to doubt. And so at that point, he told his disciples, go and inquire if this guy is really the one. I mean, picture this, you guys, a good friend of yours, imagine your friend, uh, you have them in your mind, and they've just, you've just received word that this guy has been in, arrested and thrown into committee. How would you respond? I mean, my, my thinking is, first of all, you dash there quickly, you maybe carry some food and toiletries, or you call a lawyer, call close, close friends, maybe call the guy's family, uh, and then you'd be like, what are we going to do to get to the bottom of this so that this friend of yours can get out? Am I right? So that's what we do. 
But what do you think Jesus did when he first heard about John being in prison? Before John's disciples arrived, I mean, if you think about it, maybe he'd have taken an Uber to the joint that this guy was. He'd have called his lawyer friend, Fredo Jambo, and said, boss, come and help me. He'd have called influential people. Do you know the cops? Who's the, you know, the cop of that area? You know, he would have called his disciples and said, you guys, send word maybe to the governor because we need to intervene in this situation. But let's see what Jesus does in four, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. This is what Jesus does. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, Capernaum which was uh, by the lake of Zebulun and Naphtali. I mean, let's take a look at this a little bit more. I think I have a little map that we can look at and see. This place, uh, Macarius, Macarius, Macarius was about 172 kilometers from where Jesus was in Nazareth. And then uh, instead of starting the journey towards John, he actually traveled 46 kilometers in the opposite direction. Uh, and so what he does is that he actually doesn't even go closer because he goes to Capernaum, which is actually now further. So he's actually 218 kilometers away from where this guy was. Jesus goes in the opposite direction. When you hear that your friend is sick, your friend has been put in the hospital, or your friend is in prison, you go in the opposite direction instead of running towards him. And this is how many of us feel. We feel that we're stuck in a desert situation in our lives and God has not answered. Or God is nowhere to be found. We send word to him and tell him that we're stuck, we're desperate, we're dying in our situations, but still nothing. We just want him to say something, do something, speak something, but then he doesn't do that. Instead, he goes in the opposite direction and begins to minister to others. I mean, this guy went to the beach. Because that was a beach town. So he's there maybe sipping on some drinks. You know, we don't know. He's healing other people because that's a story that we hear as his cousin is rotting his prison. I mean, John has been there for a year. But instead, Jesus is busy healing other people. The question that many of us are asking ourselves is, what about me? Or what John was asking himself, what about me? Am I not the one who announced you to the world? Why won't you come through for me? Here is Jesus' response to the disciples when they come to him. I mean, it's quite hilarious. Matthew 11, verse 4 to 5, Jesus says, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. I mean, Picture John hearing this in the prison. He's like, what? You're healing sick people. The blind, the lame are walking. Captives are being set free. I mean, of course you're the one. But then you're doing it for other people and not. You're doing it for everybody else. This is what God is doing. I mean, this is the situations we're in in our lives. This is the story of our lives. We watch everyone's number being called except our own. People's dreams are coming through. Careers are thriving. They're getting married. Guys are having awesome marriages. People are being promoted in their workplace. But then God is doing it for everybody else and not us. I mean, when uh, I got married in my 30s and, when, and uh, as I was a pastor here, at Mavuno, and I would get so discouraged because I'd be like, my friends are getting married, uh, things are happening, and things are not working out for me. I was just completely frustrated, and I felt, God, are you not hearing what's happening for you? Do you guys come to church sometimes, and you hear, it's testimony Sunday, and you're just sitting there saying, Jesus. I mean, you come even, you even get angry, you're like, ah, my gosh, and sometimes it's the pastor in the front saying, God, have mercy. You know, you go to LG and you're like, what the heck is happening? Am I not worshipping and praising the same God? And then this is what Jesus says um, to John after, after that in Matthew 11 verse, verse 6. He says the most revealing thing. He says, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. What does that mean? It sounds like he's admitting guilt, isn't it? He's saying blessed is the one who does not what God is saying in real sense is blessed is the one who does not interpret my silence for absence. Blessed is the one who when I do or do not do certain things still trusts me. Blessed is the one who when I do not answer certain prayers still trusts me. Blessed is the one who when I don't come through 
still listens to me. Blessed is the one who, when I don't speak, still worships me. Blessed is the one who, when I do not change circumstances, comes to church. Blessed is the person who trusts me and believes in me and follows me in spite of me. Amen? Isn't that a hard message? Blessed is the person that continues to trust me even when I don't seem to be acting on their behalf. This is the message he was actually telling John the Baptist. And I suspect he's telling many of us the same situation. Blessed is the person who does not equate my silence to absence. Tell your neighbor, God's silence does not equate his absence. Before I share the second story, I want to share a personal story of mine. My family, we grew up in the suburbs of Karen, hallelujah. Let me just tell you the truth. It was called Gong Karen at the time. It was shags. You know, your neighbor is like far. In fact, the black neighbor, because there were many whites at the time, was far. By the time you go visiting neighbors, my friend, you have traversed the country, uh, countryside, because you have to go. And then there were no matris. There was one thing called a ngothi, where it was face me brother type of matatu. Inside is the Maasai man and his goats and chicken. So when you enter, you come out smelling of the substances. It wasn't Karen like we see today with the hub. I'm like, what? We never lived there. No, we lived in shags. Our closest friends, my sister can testify, were our, our workers' children. Those are the ones who we used to go and play with in the mud outside. Um, but one thing happened. Um, my father worked for the government, and because he, um, I mean, you get the country has moved forward. Because he consulted for the oppos opposition at the time, uh, the government made sure we lost everything. We lost our property. We were kicked out. I'm seeing even Hicks. I don't even know if you know that story. We were kicked out of our property. We lost everything. Uh, and I was even doing form for that year. Aki, when I got a C, my dad was like, I love you, child. It was like I got an A. Because I went for an exam one day, and I couldn't do the paper. I just sat and stared because I didn't know, are we going to sleep in our house tonight? Because in the morning, we found agents telling us, get out. So we went to school. I didn't know where we would be that night. Uh, and then my dad made the decision. We had a family meeting. He was like, you know, I'm not going to push this thing. I mean, my daughter needs to finish Form 4, uh, and just things need to happen. So the, the, we lost everything at the time. But in our hearts, obviously, that case is not over. We have felt like God has abandoned us. I mean, we moved to South Sea. I mean, I love South Sea. I ended up being South Sea's finest. Hallelujah. But... <laughs> I don't know who that new person is. But we used to be traumatized. I mean, we sit in the house and we'd whisper because we can hear the neighbors. We're like, what the heck? We used to be like, hi, guys. You know, and then we're traumatized at the cost of milk and spinach. We never, ever bought milk. We had cows. We never bought spinach. You just went to the shamba. We were like, how are we going to? I mean, it was a big family discussion for guys, man, how you drink milk these days, eh? <laughs> serious. Uh, because we never bought milk. It was so traumatizing for us. We used to sit, open the windows, and like put off the lights and just look at the neighborhood. Because now it was TV. What are the neighbors doing? Wow, 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 wow. In fact, we had theories. We're like, that guy we think is a drug lord. Because like, we're like, what? It was just dramatic for us. We had never lived in such a small community space. But God did amazing things for us uh, as a family. He came through for my dad amazing ways. Um, I mean, he came through for us amazing ways as a family, and we became very close out of that situation. But in our hearts, in my mother's heart, this situation is not closed. And when I listen to this sermon of John the Baptist, I'm hearing that God may be saying, it may end like that. Turn to your neighbor and say, it may end like that. You know, we hear scriptures many Sundays of people saying the Lord will restore what the devil has stolen. But we all know John the Baptist's story. Did he come out of prison? He died. And that may be our story. This sermon is very close to me. Because I tell myself, my father and my mother worked hard for that property. Five acres in Karen. You know how much that can go for today. And it may be gone. That story really, ikondani, dani. But there's another story I want to share with us where Jesus, and you guys are like, really? Uh, there's another story I want to share with us where Jesus was preaching to uh, a stretch of people. He was baptizing, and then someone runs up to him. This is the second story we're going to look at. And he says, Master, the one you love is sick. If you know the story, you know that the one he loves was Lazarus. 
In fact, this guy loved Lazarus so much. When they came to him, they didn't even have to tell him, brother, the Lazarus of so and so, Mama Nani, is sick. They said, the one you love alone is sick. I mean, so what would you have expected us, Jesus to do? We'd have expected that Jesus would have run to save that guy. But what Jesus does, because Jesus had been healing strangers in the roadside, he had been delivering people, people he didn't know, they even touched his cloak and they were healed. But the one he loves is sick. But then what Jesus does is the opposite thing. Jesus um, loved Mary and Martha. When Jesus hears that his friend is sick and close to dying, what does he do? He stops, we imagine that he'll stop everything and dash towards him. Instead, he waited two more days. And even though everybody was wondering why, because the disciples were, he says, I am up to something that you do not understand. God is going to do something that nobody anticipates, and Lazarus can handle it. Mary and Martha can handle it. These guys hated him. He said, they're going to be mad at me. And they were. They're going to misunderstand me, and they did. They're going to judge me, and they did. Even the whole village did. And Lazarus eventually got sick and died. Yet Jesus loved him. There are many of us here who are in that situation. Because we've come to a place in our lives where we're convinced that in our waiting room, God does not care. It seems that in that situation of yours, it has died. Like the situation of Lazarus. But what God says to you is that he loves you dearly. Tell your neighbor she's talking to you. God loves you dearly. Even though you're stuck in the waiting room, God has not called your number yet. I want to remind you today that God's silence does not equate his absence. He says, don't take my silence for evidence of apathy or anger. Don't take my silence for absence. Because God is at work, even when we do not know it. What I love about these two situations is that um, the one of, of um, John the Baptist, it seemed that he could have just come and saved him, really. Things could have turned out well, yet it really turned out the other way. This other situation of Lazarus, it was the end. The dude was dead. We were like, we have even given up hope. By the time Jesus arrived, Kina Mary and Martha were like, brother, if you had been here, it would not have happened. The villagers were looking at God's suspect. Even the neighbors are looking and saying, hey, is this, are these people really Christians? The God they worship. Things are happening to them. You're struggling in your business and you're like, God, if only you would come through for me. But then God's, don't take my silence. God's silence does not equate his absence. The goal of today's message is not to have a triumphalist message. It's not a happily ever after someone. I want to tell you that, yes, everything is going to be all right. But truth be told, some of us are going to have John the Baptist endings that may never get resolved. But some of us are going to have Lazarus situations. And in the story of this story, we know that Lazarus was brought back to life. In fact, in the beginning of that story, Jesus says, your story will not end in death. What I want to tell you is that testimony is true for all of us. Tell your neighbor, your story will not end in death. Because our lives are not of this earth. We are built for the kingdom of God. And we need to get that into our minds and be comfortable with that. The point of this sermon is to help you understand how to act while you are in the waiting room. And how to act while you are in the waiting room is not to lose your faith. God is still at work even when you cannot see him. Tell your neighbor, God's silence does not equate his absence. This is what God wants us to do. He wants us to speak like Habakkuk and he says, though the fig tree does not bud, though there are no grapes in the vine, though the olive crop fields and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. You come to church this morning and say, God, even if I do not understand what's going on, I will worship you. I will lift you up. My business is not making a profit, but I will worship you. I don't have a baby yet, but I will worship you. I'm trusting you for a spouse, but I will worship you. God's silence does not equate his absence. Amen? 
Jesus wants us to have the spirit of Job and say, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Though he slay me, yet I will have hope in him. My mother to this day says God has a plan for me. There are many times I've walked into that room and I have wailed with my, my siblings because they're like, how does she still trust in God? After everything they worked for was ripped from them and they had to start afresh. Though she says, my God is able. This is what God is calling us to. God's silence does not equate his absence. Don't lose faith in the waiting room. God is working behind the scenes for your behalf. Amen.